Cool. Next up, uh, we have Nikita, who's going to talk about live programming observ observability on Linux. Great. Cool. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nikita. I'm an open source and a Rust developer from Scotland. And today I want to talk about um, live programming, which is, uh, well, basically the, the main <laughs> idea behind this talk is not about like live programming, but uh, mostly about improving the users and developers' experience uh, in observability, because like it's a very complicated topic. Um, and usually, oops, yeah. Usually the story goes like this. So I have some sort of a problem in my application and I want to debug or monitor it. And <clears throat> I have some questions about like what happens inside of the system uh, when I run my application. And usually like the way, the, the simplest way to figure out what, is, what actually happens is to ask the system because like uh, the, the operating system, the kernel is the god of the, like, of the computer and it knows everything. It knows everything about my application, it knows everything about the state of the system and so forth. But the problem is like how do we actually ask the, uh, the operating system about like uh, about the questions that are interesting that are interesting to us, like for example, how many memory allocations my application makes or uh, things like that. Uh, and well, there are several ways like you can modify the operating system source codes and make the necessary changes and introduce your own trace points. But usually, we don't do it like this, right? Um, and well, you can also write kernel modules, I suppose, but it's a, it's a very fragile process. So usually we, we also, like, we, we, we don't recompile our kernel each time we want to add some tracing functionality, right? And obviously, like, there is, a, there is, a, there is an answer to this problem, and uh, this answer is eBPF, which has been introduced to the, to, to the Linux kernel since version 3.0, I believe. It's a very long time ago. Um, and like probably most of the people in this room already know like how eBPF works and what it is, but just to give a quick recap, how it works is basically uh, what eBPF is about, it allows you to, um, to write your own uh, small programs which are executed in the context of the kernel, which is very important because like if you run your code in the context of the kernel, uh, you can access like uh, the, all the memory that the kernel has access to, and you can like make your own like main, to, to make <laughs> you can produce answers to questions you have and send those answers back to to the user space. And um, how this works is basically like the the, the main um, the main point of contention with adding your own custom code into the kernel is like basically to uh, to make it secure, because, because otherwise if you allow to run arbitrary code in the context of the kernel, it will, <laughs> it will be me very messy because like, it's, a, uh, it's a huge security problem. So what eBPF is, is like basically it's, um, it's a byte code, um, which you, like you, you write your own programs, uh, and those programs are, are compiled into bytecode, and this bytecode is then uh, compiled down to uh, x86 or your target architecture by the kernel itself. And importantly, before that, uh, before this bytecode is compiled, it's, it runs through the process that's called um, like verifying. And this verifier ensures that you don't access any like um, any <laughs> any uh, any places in the kernel that you're not supposed to access. So this is an important part of it. Um, and the ways uh, that we usually use a BPF is like uh, one of the ways is writing your own uh, writing your own code, right? And there are a multitude of tools for that. Uh, you can write um, your programs using like uh, a library that's called libbpf, and so you usually use it through uh, low-level languages like C or Rust. But the problem with that is that um, this process is hard. I mean, if you are, even if you're an experienced, experienced uh, low-level developer, 
uh, it can be challenging because like for me it was when I started using eBPF, uh, using eBPF. Uh, because there are many rules like uh, with uh, with the verifier, and on top of that, you have to write like not only one program but two of them. Uh, the one will work in the kernel space and will go through all the like things like attaching to the trace points and so and so forth. But uh, there's also the user space program, which will download the data that the kernel program sends you and uh, displays it or sends it forward. Uh, but uh, luckily, we have more tools to, to, to solve this problem. And one of these tools is, uh, for example, BPF trace, which is a simple scripting language, which looks uh, roughly like this. So you can, attach, you, you basically define the uh, trace points that you would like to attach to. In this case, it's, um, uh, it's uh, like the, this trace points triggers each time you uh, create a new process in the kernel. And next, uh, like the, there's a single line. There, there are more to this script, but it's like it's a rough estimate, right? So on this single line, uh, each time this event is triggered, uh, you increment a counter in the map, and this map is used to like communicate between the kernel and the uh, and the user space. <clears throat> Um, and well, the user space part is not included here, but basically it's also very simple and you can use it to uh, display this data or, send, or, or translate it into JSON or send it uh, to, to, like, to some other machine or use it however you like. And ro roughly how it works is like basically uh, the script that you write is, <clears throat> uh, it is compiled down to uh, the LLVM intermediate representation and this LLVM uh, uh, IR is then compiled into eBPF code and the corresponding user space code. So BPF trace does everything for you. So you don't need to care much about like uh, writing code that is suitable for the verifier. Uh, you don't need to care much about like how the user space and the kernel space communicate between themselves. Uh, it's, uh, it's very convenient. Um, and uh, the problem here is that uh, 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 EBP, uh, BPF trace is also uh, not ideal. Like, uh, it's a great tool, but <clears throat> uh, the, the thing about it is that it's a command line tool for the most part. And command line tools are fine, like we've been using them for um, more than 50 years or 60 years, I suppose. But that's the problem with command line tools because like uh, we have been using them like for such a long time, they date back into like 70s and the communication methods, like they, they, they are mostly like date back to uh, the, the like, nowadays like in year 2022, we have lots more uh, ways of communicating with a computer, right? So we have high resolution displays, we have like more input methods like uh, touchpads or mouses and all of these, like all of these uh, nice things uh, are not used when we work with uh, the command line tools. And uh, because of that, we cannot do like nice visualizations. Uh, there's no like, there, there's no interactivity with that. Um, so, um, <clears throat> uh, we, we, we can think about how we can uh, bring, uh, uh, how, how we can make these tools more visual. But before that, uh, let's take a small detour about like thinking about how we can uh, improve BPF trace further. And one way uh, of doing this is like uh, take some inspiration from database uh, as, uh, as weird as it might sound. Uh, but <clears throat> the thing about databases is that uh, they are so ubiquitous. They're like we have been using them for uh, also for a very long time, like for 40 or 50 years. And we don't notice like how cool SQL is as a language because it's a domain specific language which, are, which allows us to state the like what, what sort of data we want to get out of a database. But we don't go into like the silly details like let's go load this file, let's build a B tree out of it, let's filter this data. Like we don't specify each and every step like how exactly we want, to, we want to do this. We just describe the result we want to get out of the database and we get it back. Uh, so this approach is, uh, um, of course, it's known as a declarative style of programming. Um, and we can try to bring it into the world of Linux and the eBPF. But the obvious problem with that is that uh, we are used to thinking about 
SQL and databases as like thing that works with uh, data at rest. So, I mean, we have some sorts of uh, files. Maybe we insert some records into this file and uh, then we query this file and get some user accounts or data we want and filter it and so forth. But the Linux uh, kernel is uh, a different beast, right? So if we're thinking about like events and trace points in Linux, there are like millions of, the, the, it's very possible for millions of events to, to happen uh, at once, right? So how do you work with that? But um, uh, the thing about it is that SQL and databases uh, is not the only thing. Like there, there is a new duration of database systems uh, called streaming databases, uh, such as Apache, Flink, or Spark, and they ba they are based on the streaming abstraction, which works slightly differently from how we are used to like to to the traditional database systems. So in traditional database systems, we run queries through the you know, stored data. In, in the streaming databases, the idea is inversed. So basically we store the queries and run the data through them. So what it means is that like, we can take a continuous stream of data, uh, like, I don't know, user interactions on, or, uh, on your website or whatever, and we can run it through a query and analyze this data in ways that interest us and then push this data like forward to some, to, to some other storage or log this data or do whatever we want uh, with it. So that, <laughs> that's, um, um, that long detour was to tell that basically we can also think about uh, the Linux kernel uh, as a database too because like if you think about it, it's like uh, we, we can take this um, BPF trace program that we have seen before and try to translate it into, into an SQL-like code, right? So it's, it looks very similar to how BPF trace, trace works. And well, you might ask like, wait, what, what, what's the actual difference? Like why do we need to invent this whole new way of like uh, interacting with the, with the BPF? But the thing about this, like there is a slight difference, but I believe that it is very crucial, is that we, in BPF trace, we write programs in the imperative style and it affects our ways of thinking about the problem. Um, what SQL and SQL-like languages bring is like we, we can think about the, 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 the problem uh, declaratively. So we don't, uh, like as I said before, we don't think about like minutiae detail, like load this file, or we don't even have conditionals in this, uh, like in this way of thinking. We just say that I want to filter this data in such and such way. But the problem with this is that like SQL is still textual. Uh, but the interesting thing about it is that uh, the declarative languages lend themselves very nicely to um, be translated into more visual, uh, more visual representation, so we can try to use it like for uh, visual programming. So how it might look is like roughly like this. So you can see that we we have taken the same exact query and broke it down into uh, into sort of a data flow, uh, which you can think about as <clears throat> as a sort of a, like Unix pipes, right? So we connect visual blocks uh, with <clears throat> Um, with arrows and the data flows from top to bottom. So first we have our, <clears throat> our data source, which in this case is like a kernel probe, and it's like the, the, this <clears throat> event is like, this event that we're interested in is like uh, each time the, the, the kernel creates a new process. Uh, we then have our data sync, which is basically the um, the endpoint at which the, we, we are supposed to use this data in some way. And it can be like um, displaying this data. In this case, we are just, just displaying the number of, <clears throat> number of forks that have been made, uh, but we can also like move this data f uh, forward to, to, to some other system or display it in a visual way. Uh, and uh, next we can also, uh, as an intermediate step, we can also transform this data, right? Uh, in, the, in this case, like we, we have our filter where we describe um, that we are interested only in, in, in events, uh, in, in new processes, which like have the process name as set as a Python. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, and like this approach obviously has um, some pros and cons. Uh, the visual programming is widely used in some areas like game development, for example. You might have heard about um, Unreal blueprints and tools like that. Um, but the, 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 uh, the thing about visual, visual programming is that it has a lot of problems of its own, right? Um, the, main of, uh, the main of these problems, as I see it, is that text is just too ubiquitous as a format. I mean, if we, we don't think about this much when we use uh, like a lot of tools daily. We use version control, we use text editors, and they don't need to be specifically tailored for our programming languages. I mean, if, if there was a new programming language tomorrow, you don't need to adapt your version control. Like, you, you don't need to change Git in order to support it, right? With visual tools and visual programming languages, there's no such a way of like adapting this to the, the existing tools. You, we will have to reinvent them. But it might be like um, a blessing in disguise because uh, we can also think about inventing new ways of uh, interacting, of, of building these tools, like version control, which can be rethought in terms of like things like CRDDs or uh, things like that, but that's a topic for another day. Uh, <clears throat> but with this set of problems, uh, visual programming also has a lot of advantages, right? Uh, because it brings uh, like it brings another dimension into your thinking. Uh, you think not only like in uh, 1.5 dimensions of seeing lines of your codes in the text editor. You can think in 2D, like you can arrange your blocks of your program and visualize the uh, the data that you get out of uh, out of the kernel. Um, and the main important advantage, as I see it, is that. <clears throat> with visual programming, you get immediate feedback. So <clears throat> you don't build your program like step by step. It's just a, uh, like, as usual, you write your code in the text editor, you compile it, you run it on the kernel, you get the data, and so forth, right? With visual programming, it's a continuous process. You don't switch the context. You just build your program and see the results immediately and make the necessary changes if you, if you see that the results are not like, uh, are not what you are interested in, or uh, there is some sort of an error. And speaking of errors, I think also like uh, what visual uh, programming brings to the table is that um, it can be, uh, it, it can work and play nicely with uh, the interactive debugging because uh, you can just uh, take a switch and like you can immediately see uh, what intermediate results you are getting at each and every step. <clears throat> and there are, uh, of course, more advantages to, to this approach and declarative thinking and visualization is that like data can be visualized in, in many new ways. Uh, <clears throat> if you think about like how we use, um, how we visualize trace, traces now, we have lots of existing tools like uh, flame graphs, which is a way to visualize data, but uh, Flame graphs is not the only way of representing this data, right? There is basically an infinite number of ways of, of representing this data. And what I want to do is like to bring developers and users to, 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 to have this ability to, to experiment and play with the styles of visualization of this data. Um, and <clears throat> another important advantage of visual programming, as I see it, is it's very easy to compose programs. It's very, it, it comes very natural. And what I mean is like, uh, basically, if we look at this example, <clears throat> um, sorry, um, I think it's, yeah, yeah. So uh, if we'll take a look at this example, <clears throat> Uh, we can imagine a scenario where we have like um, um, uh, some sort of an, uh, uh, an application or a web application, and we are interested in tracing like uh, what is the number of memory allocations that are made when we hit uh, an HTTP request for the endpoint, like a login page, for example. And as you can see, like it's um, 
we can start with the event that comes from, not from the kernel, not from eBPF, but from some dynamic tracing system, for example. So we get this event, and then we pass it down to the uh, memory allocation event, which in this case comes from a user probe, which we set in, like, uh, in libc, for example. Uh, then we can filter this data by the, uh, by the endpoint, which came from the contextual information from the dynamic tracing system. And finally, we can um, you know, write this data to a log, for example. But it's not necessarily that we are uh, just take this data and write it somewhere. We can split this stream uh, into multiple pathways and also display uh, the count of allocations immediately. So we can immediately, uh, the, the, we can feed the data and store it on disk somewhere in the log, but we can also get this data and display it right there in the uh, integrated development environment that you use. And obviously, it doesn't have to be like the textual data only. So you can build nice graphs and visualizations uh, dynamically depending on your preference. Um, so now let's talk about how this, um, how this works roughly. Uh, we don't have much time, uh, and there's not, like, there's not a lot of technical details, so if you're interested in more details, you can always like, uh, ask questions or hit me later. But basically, um, uh, we can also take inspiration from the database systems here. So how databases work is like, when, when you write uh, an SQL query, it's broken down into, like, uh, into an abstract syntax tree. So how it works with, like, with the compilers, usually with programming languages. But this uh, syntax tree is not compiled into, like, into bytecode. It is instead compiled into an execution uh, plan, which uh, roughly looks like this. So first you, you know, like, um, you have a print operator which requests data from the uh, operator that uh, lies below it, and then it goes down and, and until it hits the the operator that actually sources the data from the kernel. And uh, usually, how it works in the in database systems is that this execution plan is not compiled; it's instead uh, like inter it's interpreted by the database system in the runtime, which is not very efficient. But uh, the interesting thing about this, <clears throat> if we apply the same idea to eBPF and dynamic tracing, we get some nice results because uh, we, we, still, we, we still kind of think in terms of database systems, but as a result, we can aggregate and filter data and like basically work with this data, not at the level where it is used, as in the case of database systems, where it's used in the user space, I mean. But we can filter and aggregate it in the kernel space, and that's done transparently uh, for the user. You, can tap, you, you basically have a choice. If you want to aggregate this data efficiently, you can do so in the kernel. If you want to do this on the users, uh, on, in, in the user space, you are free to do so. Uh, and, well, basically, um, <clears throat> Uh, how, how, how it's implemented is like each operator that we have there is like uh, roughly translated into the code that you see on the right side on the slide. <clears throat> uh, this is a uh, this is a pseudocode, uh, of course, because like um, it, it has to be translated into the LLVM uh, intermediate representation and then into eBPF code. But uh, at the end of the day. You don't need to, uh, a user or a developer who uses the system doesn't need to care about anything of this at all because all the verification, all this compilation is done for them. And they don't need to care about like PPF maps either because uh, given the context, the compiler can infer the uh, required number of maps and the kind of maps that, that, that you need. Um, and the Lastly, to say a few words about like the uh, the implementation, <clears throat> um, the user interface is implemented in the web browser. So, uh, the very interesting thing about eBPF is that recently there has been a new addition to the types of maps, um, ring buffers, which can work very efficiently to trans to, to transfer data from the kernel space into the user space. And <clears throat> the interesting feature that it brings uh, is that this data can be transferred in real time because we can translate it like one-to-one -one from ring buffers into web sockets and use this data in the web browser to visualize it and to, um, to aggregate it if we prefer to do so. Um, 
<coughs> excuse me. And that's, uh, that's only like, <coughs> basically, that's only a start because we can do a lot more with it, with this idea. Um, it's not only like, it's not only about eBPF, it's not only about dynamic tracing, but about the context in which we use uh, tracing to understand what happens inside, uh, what's happening inside of our system, right? And lots of moving pieces can help in understanding this context. And the, 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 uh, the idea, I think, is that if we bring all of those pieces into a single integrated development environment, it can greatly help in understanding, like in, in understanding the problems that we have, in asking the questions and giving and getting the uh, <clears throat> the answers immediately and seeing them and <clears throat> uh, making changes and getting the answers again immediately, <laughs> right? So, <clears throat> um, and to to to, to um, uh, to, to, to make a conclusion, basically we, uh, we can think about uh, Linux as a sort of a database, and I think this might be a powerful idea because uh, we, we are too used to uh, working with the code as text, which it really isn't because uh, code is more than uh, like a core, uh, code is abstract idea, is an abstract idea, and we are usually not thinking about different ways of representing code. Uh, like the, 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 there are many more ways of, uh, uh, of building our applications, um, not only in text, but in like the main specific languages, which I think can serve some, um, some scenarios better. But the, um, the thing about this is that, like as I said, the visual, um, the visual programming approach also has lots of disadvantages. So probably this uh, this way of writing like tracing programs will not work in complex scenarios where you have like thousands of <laughs> uh, thousands of different moving blocks and seeing all of these blocks in a single space can be challenging and moving them and so it's 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 a like it's a it's a set of trade offs, right? So uh, I think it's it, it can also work like with together with the more traditional approaches. So you can bring like your existing programs and run them inside of this visual context and so forth. So there's a, I, I think there's still a lot to think about. But uh, at the current stage, like the project that uh, I'm developing, I have been working on it like for a bit, a little bit, uh, a little bit less than six months. But there, I, I believe there's still lots to be done, and there's like probably many years of thinking to be done. Um, and that's, uh, for the most part, this, uh, uh, everything I wanted to talk to you about, and if you have any questions, I think we have uh, still have some time left. Right. Well, I guess I can also answer your questions later, like at the on-conference or... Yeah, we got some time for questions now. Could I could I ask someone to grab that? Hi, um, Douglas from uh, Arm. Uh, thanks for your your presentation. I was wondering um, if you explored the um, for text more text based uh, approach. If you explored something based on coroutines. Um, or anything that is uh, an equivalent of uh, of that. Uh, so the question is about like how uh, if I export some approaches of using coroutines in the uh, like uh, do you mean coroutines as in like as a primitive of building programs or like um, yeah so basically like async programming in like languages like I don't know Python Rust or I think even now C plus plus and. JavaScript. And oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, they all allow building systems that, like, compose well, like, in the same way as your, your programs because they're exactly. basically yeah. directly equivalent to... Yeah, I, I haven't explored it in detail, but I think it's a very interesting idea because, like, you can basically... Uh, I think this approach also works not only with, like, uh, things like eBPF, but also with uh, the, the traditional debuggers and uh, asynchronous, like, 
But yeah, yeah, uh, I, I get what you mean. Like, uh, so basically, async await style of coding, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's it's almost the same thing, and you can imagine writing this program in in a different way, like not in a visual way, but as a like as a set of coroutines in a text, like in a text in textual representation. And like the way I build the compiler is that you will be able to use some of these primitives as a library instead of like just uh, using it as a uh, as a kitchen, like the, the entire kitchen thing, right? Yeah. So not only as a, like, as an integrated development environment, but also as a library. Yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, Sharon from uh, Mobileye, thanks. Um, <coughs> first of all, um, uh, also, uh, I suggest uh, looking at some of the sound processing application that remind a lot of the visual uh, programming you're talking about, for example, Max. So <clears throat> I think in that context, uh, dealing with thousands of uh, boxes in, is something that Max does very well by encapsulating them in inside other boxes. So I think um, in, that, in the case of thousands of, of, of boxes, either visual or textual, it's difficult on either environment. So it's always a problem. I uh, also wanted to ask if uh, why not take this approach uh, to user space applications? What's, what's special about the kernel in that uh, context? Uh, yeah, so first to answer your question, uh, what's special about the kernel context is that uh, it's very interesting to, uh, to compile this code into, like, into the eBPF bytecode so that the aggregation happens in the kernel. But uh, strictly speaking, there is nothing special about it, right? So you can also do the processing and the, um, in the user space. But the thing about the kernel is that if you do the aggregation and filtering in the kernel space, you don't need to get this data out of the kernel. So it works very fast. So you don't, you, if, if you are interested only in a subset of events, uh, you don't need to take the entire like millions of uh, data points to just to filter out the events that you're interested in. Yes, uh, 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 I understand uh, that, but also if you're looking at a program and saying a program is a database, then I think uh, user space programs are also a source of um, millions yeah. of events that can be, uh, and do you enable doing this visually live? Like if I add a box on the visual, yes. Uh, it, it operates immediately? Yeah, unfortunately I couldn't uh, demonstrate it here, but yes, it, it works like that, exactly. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's very interesting that you mentioned that because like, uh, because this, can, this program is compiled into like, it, it's represented as a sort of a domain specific language, right? Um, but it's compiled into a lot of VM bytecode. Interesting thing about this is that like, it's not, it doesn't necessarily have to be compiled into eBPF and run in the kernel context. It can also be compiled into x86 or your target architecture and run, like you basically run the same code, but in the context of, like, yeah. of user space, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so just to add some more context, yes, uh, it's, uh, uh, I just wanted to add that uh, like the sounds, the DSP processing systems using the visual approach, it's a great example because uh, like th this problem of having thousands of boxes and working with them, it's challenging, but it's challenging not necessarily because it's a deficiency of a visual programming system. It's in part, I, I believe that it, the, the challenge comes from the, the uh, we are too used to working with text, so we are not, so visual programming systems are underdeveloped. Yeah, I totally agree that uh, 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 visual uh, environments can offer advantage in, in cases of, of big systems. Uh, it's not necessarily a disadvantage. Right. Thank right. you. Thank you for your questions. Any more questions?